We're going to go back to the year 2002 when Steve Jobs took the stage in the Moscone Center to say that the world's best music player was getting a little bit better and with support for Microsoft Windows. I'm Quinn of Snazzy Labs and this is the retro review of the second generation iPod. Let's take a look. The world's best music player, or so it was marketed, had only been out on the market for nine months when the second generation was released. The iPod second generation brought forth several changes, boosting the capacity of the device from 5 to 10 gigabytes, allowing the user to carry 2,000 songs at a time. But more monumental, and much more important than we remember it to be, it brought forth Windows compatibility through the Music Match Jukebox software. The top of the device looked essentially the same. It housed the same Firewire 400 port with an adapter included in the box for Windows users, the same headphone insert, and the same hold button. You can see here a side-by-side -side next to my HTC One, which shows how thick the device really was. A Firewire charger for the wall was also included, something we don't really see anymore. Now thanks to the fact that the device itself supported Firewire 400, file transfer speeds were incredibly fast. That was done through the iTunes client. However, the device also mounted as a USB drive on your desktop, so you could open it up and store files as a regular USB thumb drive. There were also two folders called calendars and contacts where you could manually manage these uh, items rather than having to do it through the iTunes interface itself. Windows users were required to use the Music Match Jukebox software and therefore needed to do it, well, the transfers of contacts and, and, and calendars in this more manual method. Although, to be honest, I prefer the drag and drop method. I've never liked iTunes Sync. Anyone who has owned an iPod uh, prior to the iPod Touch and the newer iPod Nanos, they'll be very familiar with this interface. Now, this software was not baked in-house by Apple. Rather, it was an existing platform called Portal Player, and Apple contracted with them in 2001 to develop the original iPod. Now, as you can see here, the settings menu is essentially the same. This iPod did feature a backlight, which was quite impressive. You could put it in any duration of time that you wanted, but I prefer keeping it off because by in turning it on, you kind of wash out the contrast. There is an extra menu as well, which contains a lot of stuff that the newer iPods that still use this touch interface do not have. One of which is a clock, which although not centered on the screen, that's something that really bothers me, <laughs> is something that I like. There are also contact lists. This was kind of a desire to be a replacement for the Palm Pilot. And so there were contacts. They could not be entered from the iPod itself. They needed to be synced. But there was a directory style uh, of working. You could have emails, office addresses, uh, phone numbers, just about everything. There was also the ability to use a calendar. Not only could you look at a calendar day by day, but there were actual events that you could see. Again, they needed to be synced by iTunes or through the drag and drop interface, but you could use the iPod as more than just a music player. And there were game, not games, game. <laughs> Brick Breaker was the only game that was released and available on the second generation iPod. There were more games that came uh, later on, but really when it started, it was not focused as a, as a gaming device, rather a, a music player. My have the tables turned, look at the iPod touch. Seldom do we do use it to listen to music. <laughs> now, this version of the iPod also supported podcasts, but not in the traditional manner that we see now. It was synced as if it were just a song, so you had to find it in the artist section, and if you decided to change the track, it did not remember where you had paused in the podcast, which we all know is less than ideal. But that syncing ability was there in this generation of iPod. Now, when you go to actually play a track, it's reading from the hard drive. And there's quite a significant delay I'd like to show you. Listen and you'll be able to hear the hard drive. Now as you may have noticed, as quickly as the hard drive spun up, it also spun back down. And that's because the iPod had two 90 megahertz ARM processors and what I believe to be a pretty significant amount of RAM because it was able to cache a pretty large part of the song without having to spin the drive back up once again. The buttons all function the same, track forward, track backwards, fast forward, play, pause, menu, as we know from the current iPod. Nothing has changed, just the position of said buttons. Now scrolling on the second generation iPod was much better. The first generation had an actual wheel that spun. 
This second generation brought a touch wheel, thus making navigation much quicker and much more seamless. Not only that, but playback on this device was impressive. I mean, I could get a good 10 to 12 hours out of this iPod without having to recharge. That's especially considering the fact that there is a spinning part, there is a hard drive inside of this thing. So a really impressive battery. The device used the MP3 metadata to display the artist, the song title, the album, as well as the duration of the track. Now I'm going to show you what I find most peculiar about the device. When you put it into the hold switch, it does display on the screen that it is indeed locked. But one thing that's interesting is the screen never turns off. The backlight does auto power off after a certain duration of time, but the actual screen stays illuminated. I actually like it because you can look at whatever time at the display and see exactly the song that's being reproduced. You don't have to turn the screen on or back off and then, and then toggle it, it's just there. And you can also access from the main menu a now playing section, which we see in every iPod and power off is the same. This is also quite interesting. There's no sensor inside the iPod to detect when the headphones have been removed. So the track keeps playing even after you quit the headphones. So was the second generation iPod really that important? Yes, it changed everything. Even though it was against Jobs' as will and many other people at Apple's, by putting this device on the Windows platform, they changed everything. They made it an adoptable device, a device that people wanted. This paves the future for the iPhone, for the iPad. Apple was months away from bankruptcy. Had they not released this device in this manner, there would be none of that today. I'm Quinn of Snazzy Labs. Thank you so much for watching. Please subscribe, thumbs up the video, and comment below. Also, in the bottom box, there are my social links to follow me on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, wherever you might desire. Thank you so much for all that you do. And as always, stay snazzy. See you later, folks.